All right. How many of you are happy to be in God's house this morning? Man, it's a beautiful day outside. It's a gorgeous day inside. And let's have, some, let's have the Word of God together. What do you say? The book of Psalm this morning. Psalm 85 is where we want to find ourselves this morning. Psalm 85. Again, we want to welcome those of you that are joining us by way of the Internet. Thank you for being with us. If you're ever in our area, please come and, and worship with us. You'll want to be sure to be back tonight. This evening, our pastor will be up uh, preaching tonight, so it's going to be exciting to have him back in the pulpit. So please come back tonight at 5 o'clock and uh, show him how much we missed him. Amen? In the book of Psalm 85, give me a hearty amen if you're there. Amen. All right, Psalm 85, verse number 6. Psalm 85, verse number 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? The title of our message is A Revival of the Ages. A Revival of the Ages. Father, be with us now as we open your word. Father, we, as we have worshipped you in our songs and our giving, now we worship you in, with the preaching of your word. Father, we pray today that there be one here this morning without Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today before they leave, they will accept your Son as Savior. Father, I pray that we as Christians will examine our lives. And, and Father, if we do not have a revival atmosphere in our lives, may today be the day that we once again have the revival fire in our own lives. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. This is not going to be a one Sunday message or maybe even a two. could be a three or four. However, we would like to get it started this morning. Thomas Paine wrote these words on December the 19th, 1776. It's an excerpt from the crisis when he penned these are the times that try men's souls the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country but he who stands it now deserves the love and thanks by men and women tyranny like hell is not easily conquered yet we hold this consolation with us that the more tedious the the battle, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. End quote. The situation in 1776 was the British were winning battles against the Continental Army and the American cause seemed lost. The American Revolution was considered an unsteady prospect and that second winter of the Revolutionary War in 1776 was a time of need for the colonies. Thomas Paine was an American soldier and author of Common Sense. Boy, that's something we don't have anymore. Common Sense. He wrote a series of essays called The American Crisis to encourage American soldiers and renew hope for the American cause. The impact of this writing was found that in General Washington ordered that Payne's crisis paper be read aloud to his troops on December 23rd, 1776. The rousing prose had an intended effect and American soldiers saw victories at Trenton and Princeton changing the course of the war. This morning, although be it not 1776, I would argue that we are in a much different war that is raging. The war that we are facing is a spiritual war, and every day Satan is trying to take the livelihood and the lives of Christians all over the world. Although Thomas Paine was talking about a physical war against Britain, I think we can conclude this too that these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis not only shrink from the service of their country, but they will shrink far more in the service of their Lord. What does America need? Today, America needs a revival of the ages. We see some examples in God's word of revivals, I believe, that should motivate us to see victories here in Bible Baptist Church. 
that should motivate us to have victories in Enid and motivate us to have victories around the world, altering the course of lives for the better. Let's first start, if you would, joining me in the book of Jonah chapter 3 and start looking at a revival of the ages. We see here in the book of Jonah chapter 3, verse number 2, the Bible says, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the, the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Here we have a town of more than 120 occupants. More than 120 souls, ordinary people doing ordinary things, living their lives in an ordinary manner. The problem with their ordinary life was it was wicked before the Lord. We can see this in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 2, when, when, when it was penned, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah, as we get into chapter 3, has already been told once to go to Nineveh. We know that he decided to go against God, and eventually Jonah has God's undivided attention. Why did Jonah not want to go? Why didn't he want to go? Well, maybe it was a personal reason. Maybe he, he, held, he held the Assyrians responsible for the tax on Israel. After all, the Assyrians were a people of war. Maybe it was inconvenient for him at the time. Maybe there was, there's this journey that's going to have to be made. There's sacrifices that are going to have to take place. And maybe Jonah wasn't, wasn't willing to make that sacrifice to go. Maybe he thought that the Ninevites didn't uh, deserve the blessings of God. Whatever the case may be, we see that God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and prophesy in 40 days there's going to be a judgment that takes place. Well, if we read in Jonah chapter 2, no matter what the reason is, Jonah had to have a revival in his own life, in his own heart, to do the will of God. In Jonah chapter 2, the Bible says this, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compa uh, compassed me about, and thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet will I look again toward thy holy temple." The waters compassed about me, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came into thee and into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. This morning I want you to understand salvation is still of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. You see, until Jonah finally got it in his own heart to have a revival in his own life, before he couldn't go do the will of God. He ran from the will of God, yet God got his undivided attention in the depths of the earth. Had a fish there waiting on him. And as he had that fish there, Jonah realized exactly what he was doing, and he was running away from God. What are we doing this morning as Christians? Do we have the revival fire in our lives? Do we have, do we have the, the necessity pushing us to go and reach our lost friends and family? Oh, I pray we do. Jonah, as we read here in chapter 3, gave him a warning in verse number 3. He gave him 40 days. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. 
And he began to enter the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. A three days journey, and he running, he's not stopping, he's running. A three days journey, and he gets there in one day. That is a revival fire that we need to have in our lives. He goes and he's saying, Nineveh, listen to me. In 40 days, you're going to lose everything. In 40 days, you're going to lose your families. In 40 days, you're going to lose your lives. If you don't turn to God Almighty th this very hour. Let me tell you something here this morning. America is falling by the wayside. America is falling to the, to the whelms and the, and the wants of the world and Satan. My friend, we as Christians, we need to get out and we need to say America will be destroyed by Satan if we don't get up and, and turn our face back to God. Amen. What is the response? We see the response in Jonah chapter 3 verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. What is it going to take? It's going to take the American people turning to God and believing God. That He is the one and only God. That He is the one and only Savior. They stopped what they were doing they, and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. You see, they stopped what they were doing. They stopped in their tracks. They believed God. They set their focus on God. They set their lives on God. They set their attitudes on God. And it wasn't just a select number of people. It was from the king all the way down. You want to see a nation change, you got to get up to the highest point, And you got to talk to the highest person. And then when a leader truly accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, a nation will soon follow. Because a change has happened in the leader's heart. Do you believe that this morning? There was a complete change as we read in Jonah chapter 8. I mean, Jonah chapter 3 verse 8. Part B, yet let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. What do we see on the American streets today? We see violence. What do we see in the American hearts? We see violence. We see destruction. We see no hope because they don't know the one and only hope, Jesus Christ. We need to go and, and, we, need to, and we need to share the, the love of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And it starts right here in Enid, Oklahoma. You want to change America, it's got to start somewhere. Why not let it be in Enid, America? Why not let it be right here in Bible Baptist Church? Why not lead the cause for a great and mighty revival in America? What was the outcome? We see in Jonah chapter 3 verse 6. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him and covered with him with sackcloth and, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. You see, what happens is now they go because of verse, uh, the earlier verses where they said they believed God. When they believed God, they accepted that he was God. And when there's an acceptance of Jesus Christ, there's a change in a life. When one truly accepts Jesus Christ, they don't want to do the things of the world. They don't want to do the things of, uh, of Satan. They don't want to follow the whims and the, and the turbulence of, of the world. They want to have that new atmosphere. They want to have that new lifestyle in Jesus Christ. You see, God hears when there's a repentant heart. When there's a repentant heart, God truly hears. And He responds. The problem we see is, number one, people don't want to even say they're sorry. Well, let's go back further. Number one, nobody wants to be told they're wrong. But let me tell you something here this morning. If you're going against the things of God, you're wrong. If you're living a life that's not pleasing to God, you're wrong. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're wrong. And you're on the road to hell, and I don't want that for you, my friend. God hears when there's a repentant heart in verse 10. Well, verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? And turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Who can tell? Well, verse 10. And God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. 
Why? Because there was a true repentant heart. There was a true repentful heart that they offered to God. And in that true repentance, they turned from their wicked ways. There was a new life. Why is this so important? Why is this so important? What, why, why have, a, why have a, re, a revival of the ages? Why have this? Well, just as Jonah had given the warning to Nineveh, we too have been given a warning. We have been warned by Jesus Christ himself that he is coming back again. Would you join me real quick in the book of John chapter 14? In the book of John chapter 14, we see that he's, he's talking here. And in John chapter 14, he tells us he's going to come back for us. And in John chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I, what? What's it the, what's the say there in verse 3? How many of you there? John chapter 14. Raise your hand if you're there. Let's all read it together. John chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You've got to stop right there. He doesn't say I might come again. I could come again. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, which in verse 2 he told us he was. So in verse 3 we know he's already done it. And he says, when I do it, I'm going to come back for you. That's a promise from God. He says, I, I will come back for you and to receive you unto myself, that where I am, what? There ye may be also. You say, well, we don't know when it's coming back. No, we don't know when. But you know in the book of Revelation chapter 22, he says something three times in one chapter. In the book of Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, verse 12, and verse 20, he says, behold, I come quickly. You say, well, he's, we've been hearing about this for some 2,000 years, preacher. Oh, but then we're 2,000 years closer to his coming. How many of you believe that, that Christ could come back today? Amen. How Truly, heartily believe that Jesus Christ could come back today. Amen. Are we living our life like we believe it? Are we living a life that's going to be pleasing to him? You see, we don't know when he's coming back. In the book of Matthew chapter 24... In the book of Matthew, chapter 24, we see in verse uh, 35, the Bible tells us, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. In verse 36 of Matthew, chapter 24, the Bible says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Only the Father knows when he's going to tell his son to go get his bride. But my friends, let me tell you, we need to be living a life, we need to have a revival fire that when he comes back, we can stand in front of him not ashamed of the lifestyle that we are living. He gives us signs to watch for in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, And he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. Ninety-nine percent of the world is trying to deceive you into something. They're trying to deceive you that there's many ways to heaven. They're trying to deceive you that baptism will get you there. They're trying to deceive you that good, doing a good job, doing good works will get you there. They're trying to deceive you that you just go to some house or worship somewhere and you'll make it in. God will understand. No, he will not understand. Because if that was the way to heaven, then I would ask you this. Why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? If there was some other way to heaven other than the blood of Jesus Christ, my friend, the cross was done in vain. For many shall come in my name, in verse 5, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. How many have heard of wars and rumors of wars? Anybody heard of that this week? See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. How many of us have seen nations rise against nations? 
I mean, saw it this week. How many have seen uh, famines? How many have seen pestilence? We had a bad one come through a couple years ago, didn't we? How many have seen earthquakes? Who would have ever thought Oklahoma would have earthquakes? But even in Oklahoma, we have earthquakes. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you out to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound, because sin shall abound, the Christian's heart are going to become cold. The Bible also tells us that there must first be a falling away. And that's not of the world. That is of the Christians falling away from the things of God. And what do we see today? We see Christians that are almost living worse than the world themselves. We see Christians that are, that are being so hypocritical of what they say and what they do. They're completely opposite. They'll come in and they'll sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. And as soon as they walk out their doors, their lifestyle is saying, Oh, how I hate Jesus. Oh, how I hate Jesus. You say, I would never offer those words. You don't have to, my friends, because your actions are speaking a whole lot louder than your words. What do we need? We need a revival of the ages in our mists. What's the response going to be today? Will you believe God? What did, what did it take Nineveh believing God? You see, when there's a true belief, there's going to be a true acceptance. You cannot accept something you do not believe in. How many of you believe in freedom? Truly. How many of you believe in freedom? You see, if you didn't believe in it, you couldn't accept it. What's the one thing the world is trying to do? They're trying to sell our freedom. Is that not true? They're trying to make us to where we cannot proclaim the things of Jesus Christ willfully. They're trying to make it to where we can't freely stand behind God's pulpit and offer God's word out because it's offensive is what they say. It's a hate speech. Well, let me tell you, my God is not a God of hate. He is a God of love. But He is a God of judgment. And He says, vengeance is mine. Will we turn from our wicked way and accept Christ as our Savior? Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 tells us that our heart is desperately wicked above all things. Why is the heart desperately wicked? Because it knows not Jesus Christ. A Christian's heart should not be wicked because it belongs to Jesus Christ. A Christian's life should not be wicked. The Christian's mind should not be wicked. But yet the falling away is starting to take place and the Christian is becoming more and more wicked by the day. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know that your heart can be made new. You can have a new heart. But you must believe God and accept Him as your personal Savior. You see, to do this, you need to understand, first of all, that you're a sinner. And that's one thing nobody likes to admit, that they've done wrong. We talked about it earlier. But you have to come to the point in your life where you say, I know I have sinned against God. And because I have sinned, I know that I cannot get into heaven. It is a sin of unbelief that keeps us from heaven. In not believing Jesus Christ, in not accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to understand, I said to all ago, I'll say it again, you are on the path towards hell. Hell will be dumped into the lake of fire, and that is the second death according to Revelation chapter 20. But God being merciful, and I don't understand this love. But in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, the Bible says, But God commendeth His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't understand that. Because I'm a dad. I have two kids. One's here, and the other one was right, right back there. You know, as much as I love your soul, as much as I want you into heaven, I'm not willing to sacrifice my kids for you. And you're out of your ever-loving mind if you're saying, I'm willing to sacrifice my kid for somebody else. You don't have that natural love. Something's wrong. 
As much as I want everybody in this building and online, as much as I want you guys in heaven, I'm not willing to kill my kids for you. But God the Father loved us enough that he was willing to sacrifice his son on the tree so we could have heaven. I don't understand that love. But the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But it goes further than that in verse 11. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again for you. But you have to confess with your mouth. And you have to say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for living against you. God, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Wash away my sin and be my Savior. And you have the promise that he will save you. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't matter your status, doesn't matter, matter where you live, what kind of a car you drive, doesn't matter how much money is in the bank, doesn't matter anything. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Christian, do you need a revival in your life? We can't be what Christ needs us to be with a mediocre Christian lifestyle. It's all God or it's all nothing. Those are the only two options. It's God or it's not. Will you accept the challenge and allow revival to hit your life? What happened with Jonah? What was the end result with Jonah? Forty days he gave him before judgment was coming. He saw the, the town of Nineveh from the king down repent. And find favor in God's sight. And what did Jonah do? He went out to the hill and he was waiting for the destruction. And he threw a pity party because God didn't do it. Isn't that right? As a Christian, are we throwing a pity party? As a Christian... Are we having a true heartfelt desire to see Enid one for the cause of Christ? As a Christian, are we going out there and do what God tells us to do, expecting nothing to happen? Or do you go out and when you witness to somebody, do you, do you give them your, your everything and try to compel them to come into Jesus Christ so they too can be saved? When you pray to your God for a revival, do you pray believing or do you, is it just words coming off your lips? The Bible tells us our faith can move mountains. The problem is we don't have the faith that can move mountains. Our faith is by what we see. And that's not living by faith. That's living by sight. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. Those soldiers that are just doing it throughout the day. Those, some, those soldiers that don't just want to take on the challenge when the weather's nice. We need Christians today that will not shrink from the service of their Lord. We need Christians that will go out whether it's 110 or whether it's 20 below. We need Christians that will go out whether the sun is shining, there's, a, there's birds chirping in the air, or whether it's raining or snowing, or icing. We need Christians that will dedicate their lives back to God and be found faithful in every service. We need Christians to stand up and be accounted for the cause of Christ. We need Christians that will not sacrifice to anything else but to Jesus Christ. We will stop our lives for a game. We'll stop our lives for a band concert. We will stop our lives for this. We will stop our lives for that. And we will make every excuse we can make of why we can't go to church. My friend, we need to make every excuse we can. We can't go to other things and make every reason why we can make it to church. Because church should be more important than anything else. Because our God should be more important than anything else. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. But so much the more 
as you see the day approaching. God's coming back. We need to be a church that's on fire for God. We need to be a church that is wanting to see souls saved. Did it excite you last week when we had four souls saved last Sunday morning? Did we forget about it by Sunday afternoon? Did it excite you when we had six people present themselves for scriptural baptism last week? Did we forget it by the time we ate lunch? How many of you know what your name is? Jasmine, put your hand up. Come on. How many of you know what your name is? How many of you ever heard of a man named Jesus? How many of you heard that he wants to have you in heaven? How many of you ever heard something like that? How many of you would like to die and go to hell? How many of you would like to go to heaven? How many of you have friends and loved ones that are dying and going to hell? Keep your hands up. How many of you have friends that are dying and going to hell? Look around. Okay, put your hand down. How many of us are willing to go out and try to reach them? See, there's not as many hands. Why is that? Because we need a revival of the ages this morning. We need a revival. We need to have the fires lit once again as we stand. With our head bowed, our eyes closed. We're fighting the war of all the ages. Christ is counting on you. Your church is counting on you. And the lost are counting on you to have a revival. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, I would invite you even now with every head bowed and every eye closed. To come and allow somebody to open the word of God and show you how you can have heaven. I would invite you as a Christian, those of you that are, that are struggling with a revival in your life to come. And kneel on these old altars and give your life back to Jesus Christ. Psalm 85 verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. God's willing to reignite that fire. He says, if you will, I will. Will you make the move for God this morning? Father, we pray that you be at this invitation. God, help us to have a revival atmosphere amongst us. Father, help each Christian have a revival fire lit within themselves. Father, we pray if there's somebody here that knows not Jesus Christ, that even right now as we're praying, they come forward and let somebody open your word and show them how to be saved. Father, we know it's your, it's your son's blood. That's the only way we can get to heaven. Father, may Christians this morning lead the way to the altars. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.